morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the second day of the Regional Science Consortium's Research Symposium. This is our 14th year, so we had a great day yesterday. A lot of good talks. Um, today is a full day with plenty of talks. The poster session is upstairs, so feel free during the breaks or the lunch to go upstairs and view some of the posters that are up there. In addition, we have um, about 17 exhibitor tables around the perimeter of the poster session. Um, a lot of our organizations that we collaborate with or partner with are up there and, and have information as well. Um, just, you know, quick housekeeping items. We have the registration table right out front. If you have any questions over the course of the day, please feel free to ask. Somebody will be there the entire time. Uh, next door to us is room 110. That's kind of like a social meeting area, so if um, you want to talk to somebody about an upcoming project or collaborating or anything like that, please feel free to use that room. Then room 108, the next one down. Um, again, similar type of room, or if you have a presentation coming up today and you'd like to practice it, there is a computer and everything set up there, so you're welcome to use that as a practice room. Right across the hall at the end there are the restrooms if you need that. Uh, lunches will be provided for presenters, so in the back of your name tag, you will have a lunch ticket. And um, there are also lunches available for purchase at the cafe during our lunch break. All right, so this is our HAB session, Harmful Algal Bloom session. Uh, we're excited to get it started. So um, one other thing I wanted to mention, we are live streaming all the presentations on our YouTube channel. So that's reachsidetv.com. And then if you miss a presentation today or you want to go back and see the presentation again, I know some of you are working on projects. So if you want to go back and see that information again, it will be archived and you'll be able to see them probably in a week or so. Um, they'll all be posted on there. All right, I am going to turn it over to our Secretary of the Executive Board of the Regional Science Consortium, Dr. Bob White from California University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I'll be your chair session for this morning. Our talks will go about 20 minutes, and hopefully we'll leave about after 15 minutes. Hopefully everyone will start to wrap up, and we can leave a few minutes for questions at the end. So I'm glad you all came this morning, and I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Joe Durst. Where's Joe? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't see you on the... Good morning, Joe. Good morning. How are you? Thanks. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Joe Durris. I'm uh, the Water Quality Specialist at the Pennsylvania Water Science Center Office of the U.S. Geological Survey um, down near Harrisburg in, in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, this morning I'm going to start us all off uh, talking about now casting for E. coli and for cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms. So this is kind of our, maybe our bridge talk from some of the things we talked about yesterday into the cyanohabs. Um, I think this is a, is, is a pretty important topic and it's a relatively new topic in the USGS, probably just for the last uh, three years that we've really been thinking about now casting for cyanohabs. Uh, but we've been doing work on the E. coli longer, so I'll use that to give it some context and then kind of move through um, into the habs. Um, I did try and limit my coffee intake this morning, so I shouldn't talk too fast, but you know, if, you, if anybody misses anything, feel free to, 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 uh, to raise your hand. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, first about using indicator bacteria concentrations at beaches. Um, so this is our, our, uh, the EPA's regulatory method for uh, recreation in uh, freshwater beaches. Um, the, and it typically depends on a culture in for E. coli. And culturing just here in this case means that you take some of the water, you, you put it in a growth media, and you let it grow for between 18 and 24 hours. Um, and you can do that with E. coli, you can do it with enterococci, you can do it with fecal coliforms. If you're in groundwater, you use total coliforms. So there are a bunch of different kinds of bacteria that get, um, they get cultured this way. Um, and one of the issues is that um, the way that this program works is it um, you go out, you collect your sample today, right, and it takes 24 hours, and you get that result tomorrow, and depending on what that result is, you close the beach tomorrow with yesterday's E. coli. Okay, so you, you might be able to see some of the flaws in the logic of that because it turns out that the water quality can change in less than 24 hours. So um, if you have, a, you know, a, a rain event, if the wind changes and there's more turbidity in the water, um, if there are more seagulls on the beach and you get more, more seagull uh, droppings on the beach, right, that can all change your E. coli concentration in that 24 hours. So the issue is, if you look at yesterday's E. coli to, to regulate the beach today, 
um, you might be under-regulating it or you might be over-regulating it. We just, we don't know. So what we're trying to push for is more real-time tools um, that we can look at today's E. coli and make a prediction about what's happening at the beach today rather than relying on yesterday's E. coli. Um, and in 2012, the EPA released new water quality recreational guidance, um, and that included the use of some of these real-time tools. So, um, you know, Presque Isle State Park with the Erie County Health Department, or Department of Health, um, USGS, um, the state park here, um, are all working together to really try and implement some of these newer tools to create safer recreation conditions and more accurate uh, predictions of recreational water quality. So I'm going to talk today about nowcasts. Um, you know, think about this as if you, if you watch your, your, um, your weather forecast last night, which has some snow in it, it looks like, for this week. But if you watch your, your weather forecast last night, they're predicting ahead. Um, rather, rather than predicting ahead, what we're trying to do is really predict right now. Um, and that might seem kind of uh, a little bit ambiguous, like why would you predict now? Well, in, in, in the case of E. coli, the reason that we do that is because of that 24-hour time that it takes to measure the E. coli, right? So we want to measure other things that we can uh, easily get to in the environment and relate that to E. coli in such a way that when we measure that today, we can now predict today what the E. coli value is. Um, so we use a, a whole variety of water quality variables. Um, and then we output either a predicted concentration of E. coli or enterococci, or we output a probability that the, that the standard will be exceeded. So you could either say uh, the concentration is 310, which is over the standard, or you could say there's an 85% likelihood that the standard would be exceeded. Okay? Um, and that, I think, is something that's familiar to people when you think about weather, right? Because if the weatherman says there's a 10% chance of rain, well, you're probably not going to bring your umbrella. But if the weatherman says there's a 90% chance of rain, you're going to bring your um umbrella and be ready for that rain. Um, and this is it, it, the same thing just with E. coli in your swimming water. Um, so the USGS has uh, developed 42 of these models around the Great Lakes beaches in seven different states. Um, here's a publication for that. It was published in 2013. You see there's a, a variety of authors. Um, from Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota and, uh, uh, and Pennsylvania um, that uh, worked to develop these models. So you may say, well, 42, that's a lot. The trick with now casting is that it's typically site specific. So unlike, say, a weather forecast that you could do for a broad region, a now cast has to be developed specifically at a beach. And so there are multiple beaches right now at Prescott State Park where we have now cast models that are built. Um, one of the other things about this is that you can't just start right away. Um, you need to collect some information. So we need to understand how E. coli relates to those other water quality variables that we can measure very easily. Um, so, and then uh, typically on the, we, we would do that for two or more years. And then on the following year, we would then test our model. So checking the, the E. coli concentrations, measuring that against what the model is predicting to see how, how effective we can be. So um, we do have a website. Um, it's run out of our New York Water Science Center office. Um, if, you look, if you just look up uh, the OH Nowcast or USGS Nowcast in Google, it will take you right to this page. Um, but what this is, this is a, a, the Nowcast page on uh, August 7th of 2018. Um, and you can see what, what kind of information you get from this. Um, you can see that uh, if it's blue, there's no condition reported. If it's green, it's a good condition. If it's a, a red, it's an advisory condition, or the beach might be posted, saying that there are elevated levels of E. coli. And then the black indicates a beach closed situation where the, the concentrations are very high and it's not recommended to, to make contact with the water. And then gray is off season or that the, the model is not being run. Um, you see, when you look at the map, kind of at the overview, uh, Press Isle kind of gets all grouped right on top of each other. If you blow that up, you see that Presque Isle has six different models. Um, you can go online the day that you're planning to go to the beach, check these out, see if, uh, see if the water looks clean. Um, pretty nice system. Um, the variables that we measure in order to make these predictions at Presque Isle include things like antecedent rainfall conditions, so looking at rain in the previous 24, 48 hours, um, turbidity in the water, so how, much, uh, how many particles there are in the water that absorb light, um, wave height, so high, how high the, the, the waves are, which is a kind of approximate measure for how the water is mixing. Um, wind speed, wind direction, so 
if you have uh, some of these beaches, you have a river, and if the wind blows across the face of the river towards the beach, that pushes all the things that are coming out of the river right onto the beach, so that becomes a very good, uh, the wind then becomes a very good predictor of, of E. coli exceedances. Um, uh, wind speed, also wind direction, solar radiation, so how sunny it is. Uh, e. coli, turns out, don't like bright sunny days very much. That hurts them pretty bad. Um, lake level, water temperature, barometric pressure, these are all things that we evaluate when we build these models. Um, and the nice thing about these, right, is that they can all be measured in, in very short intervals. Um, in some cases, in real time, it buoys, um, or a, 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 a technician can go to the site, place an instrument in the water, and take a point measurement. So it could be measured kind of continuously or discreetly. So how does now casting work? Um, well, uh, data are collected and models are run by local agencies here. It's the Erie County Department of Health, um, four to seven days per week. Um, there's site-specific data, so we build these models at each specific site, and that, that is kind of one of the drawbacks of these, um, based on on-site measurements and existing sources. So what that means is we basically um, measure all of these things every day, and we measure E. coli every day, and we develop a big data set, and then we see how all these things compare to each other with the regression models. Um, and then once we build that model, then we test the model, and then we put the model in action, and, and you get the, uh, the good good, bad, and uh, ugly conditions at the beach, I guess I would say. So uh, we compile the data. There is a Great Lakes Nowcast data entry system where users can go and they report the data day to day. Um, then we use a tool that EPA produces called Virtual Beach. This is really just a, a, a regression in, uh, from simple linear to multiple linear to logistic regression um, where you can build your models. Um, and these models are then the site-specific models that are used at each beach. Each year we do a kind of a rolling update, so we take the last year's data and then we include that into the model and we update the model for the following year. Um, sometimes that doesn't happen year to year, sometimes it's on more of a two-year cycle. It depends a little bit on how the program is funded and, and uh, what kind of data we collect in a certain year. Um, the nice thing about the beach model software, it is free. Um, and the predictive variable can really be uh, uh, anything. Um, so we, we use it for E. coli in this case, but it can be used for, for cyanobacterial HAPs as well. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So to give you some idea about how these models perform. So here is a, we like to show these because this is kind of a, you know, I think it's really a, a useful way to look at this. So this is the, this is the now cast row. And this is the previous days E. coli. So this is, is doing, uh, doing the, the regulation based on um, based on the measurement at the water when you collect the, the sample yesterday, you grow it for 24 hours, and you decide today, uh, based on yesterday's E. coli, if you're gonna close the beach or not. So the sample size that we have for now casting is 975, and we have 870, or 893 for, uh, for uh, the previous day's E. coli. So the now, the now cast is correct 84.8% of the time, and the previous day's E. coli is only correct 74.2% of the time. So we've got uh, about 10% more correct uh, closures of the beach um, than, uh, than you would get uh, otherwise. Um, now we can break that down and we can break it specifically into when the beach is closed uh, accurately and when the beach is open accurately. So specificity is a measure of non-exceedance. So this means uh, how, much, how much percentage of the time or what percentage of the time does the model correctly say the beach should not be closed? Okay, so the now cast gets it right 90.1% of the time, previous days E. coli is 85.1% of the time, so the now cast is again superior there. Uh, and then the sensitivity says how many times should the beach be closed that, that it is actually closed, that the model says it's actually closed. You see these numbers are actually a lot lower, um, but the now cast is a big improvement over the previous days E. coli. The nowcast gets it right about 61 and a half, uh, half percent of the time versus the 27.1 percent of the time. So um, we think this is a pretty solid argument that these models should be used um, more, and that they are a, a more accurate, more specific, uh, specific, and more sensitive way to uh, to model the safety of beaches. So as I said, this, all that kind of information focused on predicting E. coli, right? And that's because when we go out, we measure all those variables, and then we take a sample and we measure. E. coli in the water. Um, well, what you, the, the thing that you measure that you compare all those variables to, to do uh, or against could be, could be really anything. And uh, some of our co cooperators and our, our colleagues in Ohio 
decided that they would start doing cyanohabs measurements in addition to their E. coli measurements and just see how that worked. Um, so the, the focus then turns to your sample being collected um, when toxins are likely to be elevated. And conveniently, uh, Amber and the lab here at the Regional Science Consortium uh, is running microcystin concentrations at least weekly. So we have a bunch of data now looking at microcystin toxin in the water. Um, and then what you can do is, uh, if, you, if you have all of these uh, variables that you can, can create regression models against, then we can hopefully provide real-time swimming advisories for toxins as well as we could for E. coli. That's kind of the goal here. So um, what we're really focused on for cyanobacterial harmful algal brooms, and this will serve, I think, as a good introduction for the rest of the talks in the session, um, the bloom represents a sudden outgrowth of cyanobacteria. Um, these include the, the, the genera Microcystis, Planktothrix, and uh, Dilicospermum. Uh, Dilicospermum was formerly known as Anabina. They've changed it. Uh, there's some, some, as people study this more and more, they've, they've found that there are subtle differences between what they're calling Dilicospermum and Anabina. Um, so this was previously AKA uh, Anabina. Um, but all three of these are known to produce the toxin microcystin. Um, so if you get a growth of these, that could be related to toxins. Um, however, just the growth isn't enough to produce the toxins. Um, the conditions that cause toxin production are much more subtle and in some cases uh, not very well understood. So um, what we're really looking for then are conditions that are favoring the growth of these organisms and then assuming that there is some connection between the growth of the organism and the toxin. So um, here's some, uh, some data that's presented from uh, this kind of initial idea in Maumee Bay State Park in 2013 and 14. This is published data, so this is why we're showing you this. Um, we've collected one year of data so far at, uh, at, at Prescott State Park. We have not uh, gotten it approved yet because we're still building the model, basically. So I want to show you how this is working at other sites. So basically, uh, what, what this is looking at is the microcystin concentration. And then the measure down here is actually something you can measure in about four hours. And that's the microcystin uh, DNA uh, concentration of the gene that makes the microcystin toxin. So you can see that there's a really strong relation. So if you can go out and measure something in four hours, right, and then plug that into your model, and your model says, oh, this is a really significant relation, very highly related. Um, so we can then, after four hours, make a prediction and say, nope, this beach is exceeding uh, a, a threshold for microcystin. That's, that's the idea here. Um, and we're identifying factors related to microcystin. Some of the things that we add that we didn't measure for E. coli are um, chlorophyll, right? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, and then the other thing that we measure is phycocyanin. Uh, phycocyanin is the pigment that blue-green algae produce. Um, that's where they get their name. That's why they are cyanobacteria. Um, and so we can measure that also with an instrument that we can put right in the water or that we can hang on a buoy. Um, and uh, PC, phycocyanin, and chlorophyll A are on two of the buoys, I think, right now in Prescott Bay. So, um, so when it's applicable, then we can develop and implement these uh, multiple linear regression models to estimate microcystin concentration. So the idea here is to um, collect microcystin over a long period of time, collect all these environmental variables, including chlorophyll, including phycocyanin, and then, um, and then make predictions of when there are toxins in the water based on, on those other variables. And we hope that it's more accurate um, than the E. coli, uh, just, or just like the E. coli. So uh, we're collecting multi-year data right now at Prescott Isle Beach 6. Um, we have one year of data collection under our belts. Uh, we're continuing that next year, and then we hope that the third year would be the, the trial year where we start to run the model um, and then test uh, how accurately the model is performing. Um, again, we're collecting microcystins and nutrients. We're, you, as you noticed, there was some DNA work in there. We're doing uh, cyanobacterial genes using qPCR. That's quantitative polymerase chain reaction, which is a way that you can quantitate specific genes in the water. We know what gene cyanobacteria use to produce microcystin. So if we measure that, that can serve as a good model variable. Um, we measure physical parameters. Water temperature seems to be really important. pH can also be very important. Really interesting thing about algal blooms is that when those cyanobacteria really get respiring, remember they're photosynthesizing, so they're, they're pulling CO2, uh, some cases out of the atmosphere, in other cases they're ripping carbonic acid right out of the water, 
as fast as they can get it, well, it turns out that when you take acid out of the water, the pH of the water starts to go up. So pH can be a really specific and important variable in this that's related to the photosynthesis that, that these organisms do. Um, and then in some cases, we can actually use satellite data. Um, the problem with satellite data a lot of times is that they're making predictions in water uh, using these overpassing satellites. Um, and if the, the grid cell of the measurement overlaps with the land too much, then they can't use it to accurately predict. So you need a cell that's all out in the water. Um, but what we do is we actually look at the cells that are around the area and look at how those values are predicting and then we can include that to inform our models. And one of the things that we're hoping is that eventually our partners at NOAA might start to look at these site-specific models and actually be able to feed that data up into their larger lake scale model. So um, conclusions of the 1314 recreational study, I kind of mentioned some of this. pH and uh, microcystin concentrations uh, were strongly, or pH was strongly correlated with microcystin concentrations. Um, we had continuous monitors in the water, meaning we had a monitor that was just measuring every 15 minutes. Um, and uh, when you did continuous measurements, you got stronger models than when you just did point measurements. So when you went out and took a sample and put a sonde in the water and took that, that one moment in time, um, it was better to average continuously monitored data than it was to do that one point in time. Um, and the other thing that we figured out is that you definitely need this uh, multi-year data with at least weekly data points in order to build these models accurately. Um, and right now there are models for, uh, for cyanohabs that Ohio is running at all those sites and uh, we hope soon that Presque Isle will uh, look the same, the same way. Um, acknowledgements, Matt Conlon, Eliza Gross, uh, Rob Garner, and Brian Mallet uh, really helped to put these, uh, these, these models and, and a lot of the information in the presentation. Um, this is funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. You've heard a couple different talks over yesterday that were funded the same way. Uh, thanks to the Regional Science Consortium, Jeanette, Amber, uh, Sean, Erie County Department of Health, Karen Tobin, Chelsea, who's here, thank you, uh, PA, DCNR, Prescott Isle State Park, Holly, Matt, and Ryan. Thanks, guys. chain would be the, the, the bacteria would take its DNA and make RNA and you can actually measure RNA when you measure RNA you get an even better relation because the next step after RNA is protein which is the toxin itself so um, so yes uh, they those measurements are strongly correlated but uh, you have a four-hour time as opposed to a you know 30 second time to stick it into it. so there's a, a, a little give and take there um, cyanobacteria in general don't so all microcystins don't possess the gene to make microcystin. Um, and so that's kind of part of the, the disconnect between a bloom and toxin production. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yes, Amber. So we should, we should talk later. Um, I just wanted to let you know from our last season's data, I pulled a ton of the microcystin and the DNA and the toxin. All right. And I took it out of my talks in my mind. Okay. But Yeah, we should definitely look because that could. I mean, if you think about uh, think about halves, right? It could be that there's some that they're either moving. It could be the cells could physically be moving, or it could be that something's moving in the water, like a little pulse of nitrate or ammonia, comes from wind direction, and then suddenly you get this growth. So that's what we'll definitely. Look at. All right, thanks. I'll be uh, I'll be around all day if anybody wants to talk. Everybody get that? Good. <laughs> All right, so continuing with this, this discussion, I'll introduce Amber Stilwell from the Regional Science Consortium. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amber. Um, I work for the Regional Science Consortium. I'm the laboratory manager. Um, I <laughs> primarily work with harmful algal blooms as well as many, many of the other projects that uh, if you've been here yesterday or looked at any of the posters, we have a hand in a lot of different things going on. Um, so I have the pleasure of working on all those different projects um, with uh, Dr. Schnars. 
So my talk is about taking those uh, concentrations of toxin that Joe talked about and comparing them to the actual cell counts of blue-green algae that we're getting using a fancy machine called a flow cytometer, which I'm going to explain to you guys. Um, and I just want to share this picture with you guys. That's a picture of Lake Erie, for those that don't know, and you can see the discolored water in there. All of that green is a harmful algal bloom that is just taking over the lake. Um, this picture is a little dated, it's from 2015, but it's probably one of the better pictures out there. It's a satellite image, so for those in here that have never heard of harmful algal blooms before, this is a problem that you can see from outer space. So that makes it a little more you know, relevant to as, as to what a big problem it actually is. And I'm going to show you several pictures that give you an idea of the issues that we have right here in our backyard down on Presque Isle. So these are our sampling locations, and the beach ones nicely line up with Joe's talk. Um, we're also collecting data at many, many different sites around Presque Isle Bay, as well as all the way out to Elk Creek um, up towards Ohio, and Freeport Beach towards New York. So we're really getting this very large data set that's encompassing almost the entire Lake Erie coastline that touches Pennsylvania. We also process additional samples for Erie Waterworks and Northeast Drinking Water Authority. Um, and that's very important for you guys to know as public citizens consuming that drinking water that people are looking into that and are doing regular testing for that to make sure that those toxins are not in your drinking water. We collect our samples once a week, and we do that by um, taking a sample that's a subsurface sample. So we wade out waist deep into the water. We take a <coughs> sterile bottle, we collect it, um, we put our arms down into the water about a foot, collect the sample. If we see anything that's obviously very green, we call that a scum, and we'll take a secondary sample that of that scum um, and specifically run that so we can get our most uh, toxic um, concentration at that area. So these are all the different toxins that, um, that I know of that are produced by all the different types of cyanobacteria. Um, some of these names may be a little dated, and I apologize for that. <laughs> Everything's changing very quickly I'm, I'm in this world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but in particular, we're testing for four of those toxins. So, and actually, we do test microcystins and nodularins are in a test together. So I should have circled that one as well. Um, you can see that these toxins lie under different categories of toxicity. So you have dermatoxins, which affect the skin, and you have hepatotoxins, which can affect your liver, and then neurotoxins, which can affect your brain and your spinal cord. So we're testing for four of these toxins, like I said. Microcystin, we test for every single week. Um, when we run out and collect those samples, we're doing that uh, weekly because that's the one that we see here the most often, and that's the one we're most concerned about. So that's the one I'm really going to focus on today when, you, when I present my data. But we also test for anatoxin every other week, and that's important because that one is a really big um, dog injurer. So that one is the one where if a dog consumes that water, they can immediately start having seizures and dog deaths have occurred due to the consumption of anatoxin in the water. So we test for that one a little more frequently than saxitoxin and cylindrospermopsin, which are these two here, and they, they, we test for those once a month but we would like to increase that because we have seen results of saxitoxin popping up on, um, in Presque Isle Bay, and that's a huge problem because saxitoxin is one of those toxins that's up there with dioxin, which is one of the most toxic substances in the world. So for our testing methods and how we, issue, or how we assist in the issuing of, of advisories, we use an enzyme-linked an immunosorbent assay, um, which is AKA an ELISA test. Um, we lyse the cells using quick lice before we run them through the ELISA test. This gives us the maximum amount of toxin in the water at that time. We get those results from the ELISA test in parts per billion, so all the results that you see for the toxins are in parts per billion throughout the talk. Um, and our HAB task force, which works really diligently together with us and the Department of Conservation of Natural Resources and the Erie County Health Department, we all work really diligently to get this data out there and issue, help issue those advisories, whether they are on Presque Isle State Park or if they're out in Erie County. Um, these signs will be issued um, if the toxin level is exceeding that, um, could, that, could be, that which could be harmful for humans. 
Um, anything above the dog guidance threshold, which is, oops, right here, at 0.2 parts per billion, you're going to see the same sign, but without these um, human indicators. Um, and the reason for that is that if you look at these advisory levels, 0.2 parts per billion is really, really low compared to the 6 parts per billion that is the recreational advisory for humans. So we have two sets of signs to indicate whether or not you're, it's unsafe for your dog versus for yourself as a person. <coughs> the other thing I want to mention is that we have three ways of issuing an, an advisory. So because we run these tests only once a week, we have to somehow account for the other six days a week where the, a bloom could form. So we run the test on Thursdays, but if there's a bloom on Wednesday, we can't always run a test. Um, so what we do is, if we see a presence of a scum, then we'll issue an advisory and we'll say, okay, put up this sign just to be safe until we can test the water and get the, the confirmed amount of toxin in that water. And then the other thing we can do is count the cells. So according to the EPA, 4,000 cells per milliliter is the concentration at which could be harmful to humans. Um, and that actually is the concentration where you'd start to see green in the water. So if you have 4,000 cells per milliliter, you probably have a scum. But it's good to put a number on something, a physical number. So imagine having to count 4,000 cells per milliliter under a microscope. That would take you a very long, long time. And I know there are some people in this room who have done that, and they know how painful that is. So uh, I'm going to get to our solution to that problem in a second. To bring you guys back to Erie, uh, these are several pictures of harmful algal blooms that we have seen around Erie during our field season. These are from, I think, 2017, so from last year. And I do have a couple pictures of 2018 towards the end. Um, but you can see it presents in all different ways. Um, and this may be a, a bunch of different uh, cyanobacteria all blooming at the same time, or it could be just one species that's overpopulating the water. So our problems with our analysis is that, or with our, this whole method that we're working on, it's difficult to determine where, why and when these toxins are produced. As Joe said, you can't really tell. The, to the bloom may be occurring, but the toxin is not there. Or there's no algae and the toxin remains in the water. So this bloom is a moving target. It's constantly in motion. It's moving all over the place with the wind and the wave action. Um, the other issue is that ELISA testing takes hours and it's very expensive. And counting cells, like I said, via microscope is a tedious and time-consuming process. So our solution is a flow cytometer. I'm going to take you guys through some of the technical technicalities of the flow cytometer, um, just so you know what I'm talking about um, as I present my data. Um, so we use a BD Accurate C6 Plus flow cytometer, and these are drawings of it here. This is with its uh, lid open. Um, it has red and blue lasers inside of it, and those lasers collect fluorescent signals from cells as they are passed up through the lasers. And uh, they can detect specific fluorophores, which are, uh, Joe mentioned, the pigments like chlorophyll that these algae give off. Well, they also give off other pigments, like he said, phycocyanin, and the opposite of that is phycoerythrin. So when we're looking at our flow site, or when we use our flow cytometer, we're literally taking phycocyanins uh, um, using a specific light filter, um, and then phycoerythrins using another light filter, and we're crossing them so that the laser is going through and the light filters are picking up the exact fluorescence that we desire. So when we're looking at our graphs, we're looking at the two different fluorescences on, um, against each other. And that's what you're going to be looking at when you see these density plots. So just to give a little bit of the background research into this, um, there are multiple variations of each fluorophore. So you have a wide range of where these, um, where these algae can fluoresce at. And you can use this machine to also analyze things like diatoms, chlorophytes, cryptophytes, pretty much anything with a natural fluorescence. Um, you can use this machine to analyze and count. Um, specifically for bacteria species, uh, you can see in this bottom um, chart here, we have microcystis, anabena, and synecoxis. And those are all plotted, like I said, uh, phycoerythrin versus phycocyanin. So what you're looking at is the, uh, where that algae is 
showing up on that graph. So what we do is we take a standard and we of a known concentration of algae and like microcystis and we run it through the flow cytometer and this is where it shows up on our specific graph. And then what we can do is gate, what's called gate, around that, um, that density and project that onto the rest of our data. So if you can see the, this is our standard here, and the standard um, has been gated around, and the arrows point to where it's projecting in the data. So these two, um, these are duplicate data um, analyses from the marina in 2017, and you can see that this percentage here says it is 70% microcystis. And then this one says 6.9% microcystis. So we always run a duplicate, and I wanted to put those up there to show you guys how closely um, the machine does analyze uh, when we do a duplicate. So 7 and 6.9%, it's very, very close. So when we're comparing those flow cytometry results to toxin concentrations, we're really trying to build some kind of relationship and understand you know, how many cells have to be present for the toxin to start producing, and vice versa. Um, we take the cell counts from all of our samples that we run on the, that we do toxin analysis for. We can take them and try to find out that relationship. So the data that you're looking at is gonna be 21 sampling days from May to October, like I said, once a week. And um, just to give you a heads up about the downside of this, I have not yet been able to figure out a way to separate the different cyanobacteria um, based on their fluorescence using the machine. So I know it's possible because other um, researchers have done it and I've looked at their information and their, um, their publications, <coughs> but it's proving very, very difficult to actually do um, in my lab. So um, just be aware that the information that you're looking at is cyanobacteria cell count versus microcystins toxin. So um, just to give you some data from the 2018 season, this is our cell counts that we got, I know it's very overwhelming, um, it's just really to show you the trend. Um, it's very, very, uh, it starts in May, but the toxin constant, or the cell counts are very, very low, and then they start increasing um, once we get later into the season, especially after August, which is unfortunate because that's when we lose all of our interns. <laughs> um, and this is our uh, 2018 toxin, seasonal trend, and you can see it's a lot different. It's definitely not as nice of a trend. You, it's, uh, it's kind of all over the place. Um, we've got a pretty high amount of toxin occurring right there in May. A big spike um, in July. I had to take, I had to adjust this graph and remove that point because you wouldn't have been able to see all the other points, um, but that was the highest one that we got this summer. It was at Horseshoe Pond, and it was 15 parts per billion. Um, which is far, far above the human recreational threshold. Um, and then throughout the rest of the season, we had highs and lows um, occurring. And even um, our last sampling day, which was October 25th, we did still see several sites that were exceeding our dog safety thresholds. So to compare the two data sets, I just pulled four different sites for you guys to look at. Um, this is comparing the blue-green algae or the cyanobacteria cells per milliliter versus the microcystin toxin. So they're, um, what I really want you to pay attention to is the R-squared values, showing how strong that trend is. Um, for Vista, excuse me, Vista 3, Sturgeon Bay, and Perry's Monument, the trend lines kind of line up. They're, they're doing pretty well. Um, so what that shows us is that as toxin increases, cell count is also increasing. However, at other sites like Agonia Beach, we have a completely opposite trend where they actually cross in the middle there. So at Agonia Beach this summer, we saw toxins increase and then <coughs> cell count decrease. Um, so there's a lot of issues when comparing this data and not all sites are made the same, which is why it's so important to develop predictive models like Joe talked about based on your location. So those predictive models can be um, made for that same location so that you can take this data and actually feed it into that model and make sure you're getting spe uh, location-specific information from your prediction. So this is um, just an overall trend of comparing the cyano cell count to microcystin toxin. And for 2017-2018, they do pretty well. Um, you can see both seasons 
pretty much agreed that when cell count was low, toxin concentration is also low. And obviously on the opposite of that, when cell count is high, then um, toxin concentration also tends to be high. But uh, when I did my correlations between uh, the cell count and the toxin, I had a little bit of a flip flop from 2018 to 2017. So looking at it on a graph is a lot different than actually correlating that data using statistics. Um, in 2017, all these green bars represent strong trends um, showing a positive correlation, meaning that they're positively related, um, higher than 0.5. Um, and in 2018, you can see we have much less of that. The gray bars are negative correlations, and then the blue bars represent uh, a weaker uh, positive relationship. So you can see that they didn't quite line up, the years didn't quite line up with each other. Um, and I haven't quite figured that part out, but as I said in my question to Joe, I have a lot more information to go through um, to try to figure out what happened. So this is a little bit of information from 2017. Um, I, I mentioned that each site is specific. So if we take our, all of our beach locations and put them in a group together, all of our bay locations, which are uh, locations that have some intermediate water movement, um, bay locations would be, or beach locations would be the opposite of that. They have a lot of wave action happening. Em embayments um, are locations with very little water movement. And then tributaries are obviously water moving into Lake Erie. Um, if we take them and look at the relationships at those specific sites between toxin and cell concentration, um, we do get a little bit better trends. So um, this could indicate that um, a lot of these sites need to be specifically looked at and you can't just bunch them all together. They're all, uh, it's, you know, it's an environmental system and it's going to behave differently depending on how the system is built. So the, um, to sum it all up, we do have evidence that the you know, if there's a lot of cells present, then there's gonna be high toxin concentrations in the water, especially in those bay areas, because they don't have as much water movement happening there. We could potentially use flow cytometry at some of these sites prior to our peak hab season as an early indicator of high toxin concentrations. So instead of um, spending a ton of money on testing ELISA, or using ELISA testing and the man hours involved in that, we could potentially go to these sites and collect a water sample and run it, count the cells, and then use that as an indicator instead of running the whole toxin analysis. Um, I would like to focus our prevention strategies and our education and outreach strategies in these areas with those parameters that I mentioned. So these bay areas that are more prone to um, things that are correlating to our, um, our cell count and our toxins being high. So like warm air and water temperatures, like Joe said, a high humidity, wind direction and wind speed I mentioned in my question have a lot to play into this. Um, so we could focus our efforts on those areas and try to um, build models for those areas um, and uh, work more towards our goal using those areas that we know a little bit more about why the toxin is occurring there. So um, this is a photo behind there of the bloom that we saw on Beach 10 in 2018. This was a very extensive bloom, um, but the main focus is that I want to thank all of the wonderful people that were part of this project. Pennsylvania Sea Grant and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, helped to fund this project. Um, the PADEP -E Coastal Resource Management also helped fund this project. BD Biosciences helped us to um, analyze our data a little bit and kind of guide us along our way using the full cytometry. And then our, our um, intern team and our staff at the RSC, Dr. Schnars and Sean Dalton specifically, as well as I know Angelina Belfour is in the audience, um, and all of our other wonderful interns that have put time and um, effort into this project. And then I can't um, forget the HAB Task Force. And if anyone doesn't know, um, the members of that are very, very far and widespread, um, but the, the main people are the PADEP, DCNR, ECDH, which is Erie County Health Department, Pennsylvania Sea Grant, us, the RSC, and then I also threw in um, Northeast Waterworks and Erie Waterworks. And then I'll take questions if anyone has them. Are you, do you do it like on, 
on the day you do it like what's the what's the lag between sample collection and having data that's a really good question so unfortunately it varied throughout the season um, because we do so many sites it does take us quite a long time to run the sample each sample takes about 10 minutes to run because we run um, one milliliter in five minutes so we do two mils as a duplicate so 10 minutes per sample um, during the season when we have a lot of interns working for us, we can have somebody running that flow cytometry and we can finish it up that day. Um, then we, if we can't finish it up that day, we do uh, refrigerate the samples in the dark and then bring them back the next day. Yeah. So Amber, uh, uh, many of the uh, phytoplankton, especially the cyanobacteria, occur in a colonial way as clumps of cells, or some of them are long threads of cells. Uh, the, the, the machine, the cytometer, is, uh, it, does it, if a clump goes through, does it count that as a single cell, when in fact it, it might not be a single cell? That's another really good question. Um, the research that I uh, looked into when I was Look, like trying to figure out what parameters to run the machine on, um, suggested using five micrometer uh, SIP width, which is you can adjust the size of the cell that's being pulled up through there. Um, and something that we have been trying to work on is how to break those colonies apart. So there is a little bit of error there. Some of the cells that have been counted are probably single cells. Some of them are probably um, colonies of cells, but no larger than five microns. Um, so the cells in colonies can be up to 34 microns, or uh, I think bigger or smaller, give or take a few microns. Um, but so anything above five microns was counted as a single cell. Okay, thank you, Amber. Yeah. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Michael Campbell from, from Mercyhurst. And if I can get this up, you're going to This is exciting. I, I've given a lot of talks about algae in my career, but I've never had a room full of people like this. <laughs> uh, my presentation is going to be at a very different level of resolution than the previous ones because I'm looking at little itty bitty things uh, inside the microscope that are inside uh, the microcystis colonies. And my, my title uh, as a question, could microbes symbiotic with colonial cyanobacteria in Lake Erie's Prescott Bay affect the release of toxins during harmful algae blooms? Uh, the answer is probably. So I could just stop now. <laughs> and my co-author, uh, Angelia Belfior, uh, has already been identified by Amber. Uh, she did almost all of the work of counting all of those hundreds of thousands of cells that uh, were part of our data. We didn't use flow cytometry. We did things the old-fashioned way. And uh, Angelia learned all those techniques, and I'm grateful that she had an opportunity to work with Amber in the summer internship because now she knows the way it's going to be done in the future, I guess. And my other author, uh, Dr. Rick Diz, is going to be speaking after me, and he's going to give you the full details of what motivated uh, us to be in the field to be doing all of this uh, collecting, and those are his graduate students. And he's, he's got all of us named on his talk. And our effort was uh, to support the development of a model for predicting harmful algal blooms in Prescott Bay. Uh, this is my entry in the uh, colorful scum picture of the day. Uh, we've seen a lot, uh, and I, I think that might be a, a good idea for future HABS conferences. We could have scum photo contests. and. Uh, isn't that colorful? And this is what they look like when you uh, put them under a microscope and check them out at about 100x magnification. And uh, there's, there's probably at least four or five different species of cyanobacteria in this photo. And these are all colonial types. 
And I'm not going to apologize for Anna Dina. I, I, what with, with Joe told us about the new name, I can't even remember what he said. I know it started with a D, but, <laughs> but that's news to me. And I'm wondering, Rick, if we have to go through and edit that report now. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, this is the toxin, microcystin, uh, and I am not a biochemist, so I won't say anything else about that. <laughs> And this might help for Rick's study. Uh, our work was uh, old-fashioned sampling to uh, quantify the abundance of the algae and other plankton that are associated with the blooms. And uh, we sampled at three different locations, mid-bay. Uh, those are the dimensions of the bay. Uh, we sampled about every two weeks at the three sites from June through September for two summers. Uh, our samples, uh, most of the, the quantification was done with samples taken with a 65 micron mesh with, with, con with constant style plankton net, uh, triplicate vertical hulls, and uh, this is what the sample looks like in a jar. Uh, the cyanobacteria are kind of interesting because they typically will float up to the surface of the container even after they're preserved, which uh, they don't all float though, and Angelia can tell you, you have to count them, uh, the ones that sink too. Uh, Trevor Surgener helped us the first summer, and, and he's, he's now working in Alaska doing aquatic biology work. But uh, Trevor and uh, Angelia did the ELISA testing for the microcystin during the first summer. Uh, we didn't do it during the second summer. And uh, Amber, uh, the, I, I found this photograph of Amber. I am so proud of her. She was a student of mine in a freshman biology lab. And I had them do experiments with microcosms of algae in jars, and, and doesn't she look nice and green? <laughs> I think the green algae and the green countertop, you know, they all kind of go together. And I just had to include that picture. Uh, this is what some of the data looks like for the microcystin concentrations, and these are, are data that were provided to me by, by Dr. Diz. Uh, the orange and blue lines show the, the seasonal variations in the microcystin concentrations over the two years. And uh, the red rectangle here kind of shows the peak of the microcystin levels as, as Rick calculated them during 2017. And then over on the right is a graph that shows the variations in the, the biomass of the, the different types of cyanobacteria during 2017. And this is the data that, that Angelia renders uh, with all of her counts and then converting the counts to biomass. And, uh, but what you can see here is the red rectangle on the right matches up with the red reg rectangle on the left and corresponds to when microcystis was the dominant algae. So it, it did look like, at least in 2017, that peak microcystin levels were corresponding to when the microcystis cyanobacterium was dominant. Uh, the main thing that I am intrigued by is what exactly triggers the release of the microcystin toxin. As Amber pointed out, uh, there's not necessarily a direct correlation between the abundance of the cyanobacteria and the highest concentrations of the toxin. They seem to produce the toxin and hold them inside their cells and, uh, and then subsequently release them. And we don't know, uh, as when I say we, I mean the scientists that study these things, don't have all the answers yet as to the mechanism that causes the release of the toxin. Uh, I just discovered this paper last evening, uh, the 2018 paper, that, that seems to be kind of putting uh, something solid on the release of toxin by planktothrix, suggesting that its uh, temperature is the primary variable. But that's planktothrix, and I, I don't think we have too much planktothrix in the bay. Uh, what we've got is a lot of microcystis, and uh, I found another uh, recent article in 2016 a review on microcystin or microcystis ecology and the the review didn't provide as simple an explanation for the trigger as what the previous paper did for planktothrix. So this review identified five different uh, sort of abiotic factors including light and nutrients and temperature and uh, the, the ways that these cells will uh, try to process metals uh, have been correlated in laboratory studies with toxin production, uh, but also some biotic 
triggers have been identified. Uh, some scientists have done research that makes them believe that the interactions between zooplankton, which feed on the phytoplankton, including some cyanobacteria, might trigger the production of the toxin, perhaps as a protective mechanism. Uh, but others have considered the fact that maybe these cyanobacteria, which often occur in mixed, uh, in a bloom, you don't have monocultures of microcystis. You typically, in a, in a scum sample, you're going to find five or six different types of cyanobacteria. And since they're probably competing with one another for the same resources, including light and oxygen and the nutrients, it would make sense that maybe they're they're using these chemicals uh, sort of the way that plants use allelopathic compounds to kind of carve out an advantage over others. So uh, communication or allelopathic kinds of interactions between the cyanobacteria could be another explanation. Uh, what really got me to want to plunge deeply into this was uh, a sample that I had taken back in 2014 um, right at the beginning of my fall limnology course. And uh, I, a student had put uh, a drop of water on a slide, and under the microscope, uh, we noticed all of this stuff that was in the halo surrounding the microcystis colony. And uh, from that point onward, I, I began, whenever I had an opportunity, taking the slides uh, to higher levels of magnification than you would normally use when you're doing your cell counts. And I'd, I'd use a thousand X magnification and a drop of oil on the slide to use oil immersion. And it opened up a whole new world of things that live with microcystis. So I think that it's quite possible that maybe some of these microbes, and there's quite a few different kinds, could be involved in triggering the release of the toxins. Uh, this is a, a photograph uh, that I took after treating a sample with a stain called Alcyon Blue, which is uh, differentially stains carbohydrate material. So the brown things are the microcystis cells, and the blue stuff is where there's this, this wall of carbohydrate material that surrounds the colony. And you can see there's quite a bit of volume to that, and, and there's a lot of things stuck to it and in it. And uh, that's one of, the, one of the surfaces through which microbes interact with the microcystis colonies, is through this carbohydrate material. Now here's just another one with, uh, instead of a nice crisp outline to the carbohydrate layer, this one has sort of a fuzzy cloud of a layer. And you can kind of see in this image that there's, there's things in there, uh, not on the outside of the uh, polysaccharide sheet, but inside. So uh, I began to, to start taking pictures of all the things that I was seeing. But I want to point out that microcystis is sort of unique among the various colonial cyanobacteria in having a very well-developed sheath around it almost always. And in the Anabina photo over here to the right, you can see that it's they're, they're naked cells. There isn't any kind of polysaccharide sheath around them. So I don't know that Anabina or the D thing uh, could have the same sort of relationships with other microbes as microcystis. So now I'm going to show you pictures of the different kinds of things that I sort of wrapped up a list of what lives with microcystis colonies. There's a diatom, uh, and always the same species, Nichiopalia, that occurs in sometimes dense swarms within the, uh, the polysaccharide sheath of the microcystis. Uh, there's a variety of green algae that I've found in them. This is a, a photograph of Chlamydomonas epiphytica. It's a tiny little, usually free-swimming uh, or attached green alga that you often see attached to diatom colonies. But I, every now and then I find one of those embedded in the polysaccharide sheet. And then there's another type of green algae called Caraceum that uh, is always deep inside the, uh, the polysaccharide layer. And, those are the cells here that, that are larger and a little bit more elongated with points. Uh, there's like a swarm of caraceum uh, inside this colony. And th there's a couple of different species of caraceum, and the one with the little curved hook is caraceum curvatum. Uh, some of the kinds of green algae that we usually see uh, free living separate from cyanobacteria also occur sometimes embedded within the, the sheaths around the colonies. These are probably leocystis, 
uh, cells right here. And you notice uh, also these stalked protozoans. Uh, and I, I, as I was putting this presentation together, I noticed that, that whenever there were green algae embedded in the microcystis, there were also almost always stalked protozoans. So there, there could be some interesting complex interactions involving some of these higher organisms with the cyanobacteria that, that nobody knows anything about. Uh, and the, the ciliated protozoans are, are the, the most fun ones to look at and photograph when you've got a live sample. But this is not uh, microcystis. This is a species of anabina that uh, often has a lot of uh, these stalk protozoans with it. And I've noticed that uh, when you've got microcystis colonies that have a lot of stalk protozoans, they're often in a state of degeneration, which makes me think that maybe these things serve as the undertakers of the cyanobacteria world. They, they help to process the decomposing materials as the colonies degenerate. Uh, flagellates, including a dinoflagellate, this is glenadinium, uh, that uh, rarely, uh, but uh, caught this one on a photograph that was stuck in the sheath. And some really strange things that are non-photosynthetic that you have to look very carefully for that appear to be on stalks. And these are little flagellates that are like two-headed uh, mini monsters that uh, stick their heads out from beyond the polysaccharide sheath of the colony. And sometimes they're in twos, sometimes they're in threes or fours, but I have no idea what this is. I've not been able to find any, any sources to identify or classify these things. Uh, another very interesting critter, if you've uh, taken an invertebrate zoology class, you might recognize this single-celled uh, coanoflagellate, which is a, a type of uh, primitive animal-like cell. And uh, I've seen these already in, in a, a halo surrounding microcystis colonies. And if you know anything about coanoflagellates, it's the type of cell that sponges use to generate the currents that they use to pull in bacteria to feed from the water column. So this, this microcystis colony here is, is functionally just like a primitive sponge with that large cluster of uh, coanoflagellate cells uh, in its outer matrix. And here's just another picture of the coanoflagellates under oil immersion. You can kind of see the microvilli are what form the little, little triangular structures, and in a few of them you can see the single flagellum. Uh, but you'd never see these things without oil immersion and taking the time to, to look at them deep. Uh, in terms of, uh, among all of these things, what is, in my mind, the most likely candidate for a trigger for toxin production, I would have to go with the things that are almost uh, consistently present as part of the the symbionts, and that would include true bacteria. Uh, in the photograph on the left, you can kind of see a very grainy appearance, and that's uh, some sort of very, very small bacteria that's extremely abundant in there. And on the right, uh, the, what looked like, uh, uh, I guess, it's streptococcus type bacteria, that's actually a very small type of cyanobacterium, uh, which is called Pseudoanabina musicola. And this is another one that had its name changed recently. They used to call this Formidium mus musicola. But other people besides me have documented previously that this very, very small cyanobacterium often is associated with microcystis. And I've noticed, and I don't have a lot of supporting data yet to back it up, that uh, when the microcystis colonies appear to be degrading, that's when you're more likely to see a high density of, of these little little chains of uh, a tiny little pseudoanabina. So that would be my uh, my candidate for future research uh, to investigate this. Although I think I'm going to have to get some different techniques and some of this new stuff in order to do it right. So I just want to thank Sean Rafferty who uh, supported us with the funding through Pennsylvania Sea Grant. And if, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, it's something I've read about too about eubacteria and the interaction of cyanos. 
Um, do you know, have you, in your research outside of this, have you read anything about um, the homo serine lactones, the cell to cell communication molecules? That, I have not. Yeah, so there, there's, there's, a whole, uh, there's a whole body of literature about how you bacteria communicate with each other, and there are some people who, you even mentioned it, like hypothesize that the microsystem toxin might somehow be related to some kind of communication. But I'm always curious, and I've never found any literature, if anybody's actually tested to see if cyanos have receptors for the HSLs. That would be another interesting angle to dig into. Yeah, like the, the, the bacteria can talk back, basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I remember being wowed when I discovered that mycorrhizal fungi right. have bacteria that are really important in their ecology, and, you know, we, we just haven't looked at those sorts of complex interactions. Right, yeah, not to... at all. And so that's great. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, our last speaker before lunch is Dr. Rick Diff from... Yeah. Get you mixed up. Sorry. Thank you. Well, I think this is just an incredible. Do I have to stand behind the microphone? Yeah, you can stand wherever you want. Thank you. Might take uh, this is just an incredible uh, turnout for our event this morning, and I want to thank all of you for coming. I, I hope that uh, it uh, doesn't disappoint you and that you will have learned uh, uh, what you had been searching for relative to this problem that we experience uh, uh, here in Erie. Uh, Prescott Bay is sort of the defining feature of, of our community, and it's important to all of us, I think. Uh, so I was really fortunate to uh, know and become friends with Dr. Mike Campbell, who just sat down. And I don't know about you, but there is no way that I could look through a microscope and figure out all those little dots and specks and strings and clumps and for uh, Dr. Campbell and Angelia to do what they did as part of our joint project was invaluable to me. Uh, uh, there's no way I could have uh, come, uh, come anywhere close to uh, determining the information, to discovering the information that was uh, really important to the outcome of our joint project. Uh, also, uh, we have in, in the room here Sean Rafferty, who's the uh, local director of uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant Program, and, and that uh, organization provided the funding for a multi-year uh, project that, uh, that I'm going to talk about. Those of you who were perhaps at this event uh, two years ago and last year uh, uh, might remember uh, Mike and I talking about the work as it was unfolding for us. And uh, so I, in, in this presentation, with only the few minutes I have, uh, they put me right before lunch. So it means I have an hour and 20 minutes uh, to talk, and I can easily fill that. <clears throat> if you uh, brought a sandwich with you, you might uh, want to get that out. So, uh, so there's no way that I can uh, present to you all of the uh, information and details of what we've done in just these uh, few minutes that I've got available to me. Uh, you, you've seen some of these images already. Uh, we know where we are. When I give this talk to other groups, they might need to know where Prescott Bay is. And uh, Mike uh, had a very similar uh, slide showing, this is a Google Earth image, of course. We had these sampling locations that we visited every time we went out over the course of two summers. We went out a, a, about every two weeks, so we have eight sampling visits uh, uh, for each of the two summers uh, out into the bay. In addition to samples that we collected out in the bay, which I then, for many of my uh, needs, uh, 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 average those together, uh, the data buoy uh, was provided by the Pennsylvania DEP. Uh, we also had a, a stream monitoring station at uh, the mouth of Mill Creek, right near the wastewater treatment plant and we have had one at the, near the mouth of Cascade Creek. Those are the two largest streams that flow into Prescott Bay from the watershed of Prescott Bay, which of course is uh, uh, pretty much the, the, can I say, metropolitan area of Erie, including uh, the city and Mill Creek and other uh, nearby 
uh, uh, areas. Uh, Mike also had this information. Uh, I, I changed, in, in, in the course of the modeling effort, I changed a couple of these values. Uh, uh, there's a dredged area here that the Corps of Engineers maintains for large ships to be able to come and go through the channel and, and operate right here in the front of the commercial docks. And for some of my purposes, I uh, ignored that extra depth. Uh, uh, Presque Isle Bay is, uh, uh, as I said, really important to us, but we're, and we've been concerned about its health for a long time. Uh, this shows a history of uh, what's referred to as trophic index information. Uh, that's a way of, of gauging the health of a body of water in terms of its um, uh, aquatic ecosystem. Uh, a really high quality body of water will be clear, have very low productivity, low concentration of algae and other aquatic organisms, and we consider that to be desirable. We don't want to grow crops in Presque Isle Bay, in other words. So we're not, we don't want to fertilize the bay so that we have profuse growth of organisms. Uh, this, this zone in the middle is called the eutrophic zone, and that is not good. Uh, and we've been pretty much in it. And our data recently shows that uh, we're perhaps heading in the wrong direction. Uh, there seems to have been a a good trend in uh, the in the 90s, where the where where the measurements were heading down, but more recently things to things appear to have been getting worse. And these are based on several different factors that I don't have time really to talk about. Uh, the toxin data that Amber and her team have uh, generated uh, has been really uh, important and helpful to us for so many reasons, as you've heard already this morning. I took just the base sites and average those together. Those are locations around the perimeter of Presque Isle Bay. I took the, just those sites, averaged them for each sampling date, and produced uh, uh, this graph. This is uh, similar to what uh, Mike had on his slide as well. So this is uh, 2016 and 2017. He already talked about that peak. I overlaid some of those threshold values that Amber mentioned so that you can see where uh, where those are in relation to the actual measurements. And, and Amber pointed out, these are lysed samples. So this, this doesn't mean that the toxins out in nature are free in the water uh, in order to estimate the maximum potential toxin that could be in the water. Uh, she destroyed the cells, releasing cellular contents into the water, and then did her analysis. And, uh, and I'm going to come back to this. Uh, uh, set of uh, measurements later. So the, the goal of our project was to um, understand what the factors are that control the abundance of these undesirable organisms, these toxic cyanobacteria. And uh, in order to do that, we had to accumulate a comprehensive data set that included measurements of the chemistry of the water as well as the plankton in the water. And we also, as I mentioned, uh, we're monitoring what comes into the bay from those streams, Cascade and Mill Creek, so that we had a, an estimate of what kind of uh, nutrients and sediment was flowing down those streams uh, from the watershed, because that contributes to what the uh, reality in the water is. And so that was really important information as well. Uh, uh, then, we, uh, then we used a computer uh, aquatic ecosystem simulation that was produced uh, and sponsored by the US EPA that's been in existence for probably uh, 20 years called Aquatox. It was uh, originally intended to be focused on toxic organic chemicals like pesticides and herbicides, uh, but it's, uh, it's quite suitable for uh, studying the effect of uh, nutrients and eutrophication in general. And of course it has to simulate the aquatic ecosystem in order to do that. So we needed a bunch of data in order to supply it to this model and then customize the model to suit our particular study site, which is Presque Isle Bay. It's geography, it's uh, depth and length, and, uh, and what's typically found in it. And we hope that if this model works, 
that it then could be used by folks who want to do something about it. Uh, how do you know whether a certain project that you might conduct in the bay or in the watershed would have a benefit or not? We hope that this computer model will aid in making those kind of decisions. Uh, this is a little cover page from the user manual, and this is a description that EPA uh, uh, uses to describe what the model uh, is good for. So we had to simulate the ecosystem by including organisms or groups uh, uh, at every level in the ecosystem from the microorganisms up to the more complex things like uh, fish and several different uh, layers of fish, the fish that graze on the algae, the fish that eat the little fish, the big fish that eat the other fish. And so, uh, so there are uh, there is a data requirement for all these sort of things, and uh, we had to do our best to try to uh, include those appropriately in the model. Uh, we accumulated actual weather information and measurements about our location, uh, and then loadings, you'll hear me talk about loadings a lot. Loadings are the movement of water and uh, physical material from the watershed into the bay. And the three primary things that we, other than the water itself, the water flowing into the bay from, from its watershed, the three, uh, 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 the two chemicals and, and other material are nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments. Or as this model uh, uh, focuses on what they call in the model detritus. Detritus is uh, particulate matter that is organic in nature. It might be alive or it might be dead, but it's organic in nature. Uh, once we uh, set up the model, uh, uh, then we had to make the model work. Uh, it doesn't automatically uh, come out right. There are a lot of uh, decisions that have to be made in order to calibrate the model. So that meant running the model and matching it to our actual measurements in the bay over and over again and trying to improve a number of factors where you have a decision to make. For instance, how fast does each of these organisms or categories grow? How do they grow? What do they feed on? How much do they feed on? Uh, what is their requirement for nitrogen and phosphorus? How are they affected by light? All of those uh, factors have a range of acceptable values. And calibration is the art of uh, choosing a set of numbers within an, a reasonable range for all these factors, hundreds of factors, that gives you a, a, a model output that corresponds with what we've actually seen in nature. And then after you've done that, hopefully when you run the model for another year's worth of data, it gives you reasonable predictions of uh, of, of what actually happened uh, in a succeeding year. Unfortunately, we only have two years of data to work with, the summer of 2016, the summer of 2017. So jumping over a whole lot of other details that I could have included uh, to some of the output. So this is, uh, uh, so that you can understand what you're looking at here, the, the line corresponds to the model output and the dots correspond to actual measurements. And the goal, of course, is for the line to correspond with the actual measurements as best as we can get it. Now, it's difficult to see because of choices I made. There's a dot right there, a green dot, uh, various green dots, little red line, little purple line, lots of little blue dots. Uh, the little blue dots are phycocyanin measurements from the DEP buoy. We don't know exactly what those measurements mean in terms of a real concentration, but they show us a pattern, and uh, we use the pattern. Uh, each of the, this green line is the cyanobacterium lingvia. It turns out, based on Mike and Angelia's work, there are three genera that are most abundant within the cyanobacterial group. Lingvia, which you haven't heard a lot of mention of, is the most abundant uh, cyanobacterium in Presque Isle Bay. Uh, microcystis, and then 
and Avena, right Joe? So uh, that's what these three, so we included those three uh, cyanobacteria by name. Uh, this, oops, since we're most interested in microcystis, uh, this is uh, just, it's right down there. So this is just isolating microcystis. So these blue dots are the actual measurements that Mike and Angelia came up with, and that line is what the computer model generated that uh, corresponds pretty well, I think, if I say so myself. Uh, these, this is uh, uh, output of the model for chlorophyll, and those dots are chlorophyll measurements uh, taken by the data buoy. This is something called Secchi depth, which is a, a simple measurement we do to, to, to quantify the transparency of the water. The black dots are the actual Secchi depth measurements we made during 2016, and the red line is what the model generated. Oh, notice that there are extreme variations in that line. So one of the challenges that all of us who are interested in this have is that these blooms, these changes in the, what's going on in the water, occur and disappear fast. And if we are out there on the wrong day, uh, we miss that. That's why the buoy, the data buoy, the continuous, so-called continuous measurement is so valuable and helpful to us. Uh, this is a phosphorus in the bay, so that red line is the prediction that the model made. And those dots are our actual measurements. These are some, some numbers that show more precisely how the model and our field measurements agree. Uh, this shows how well the model did when we moved to 2017. So this on the left is the summer of 2016. There's that one dot up there at the peak. Uh, here's 2017. It overpredicted Lingvia, uh, did a better job with uh, Anabina and Microcystis. Going back to I'll call it AMBER's data for toxins. Uh, I have overlaid the microcystis uh, abundance with the Bay uh, microcystin toxin measurements. And they're offset from one another a little bit, but the general shape is quite uh, uh, remarkable. And for 2017, it matches up. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost a perfect overlay for 2017. Of course, the vertical scales are different, but the pattern is what's important. So if the model works, what, what can we do from that point on? We can investigate possibilities that where we could not do an experiment out in nature, we can use the, the uh, model to do experiments, basically. So uh, 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 what we'd like to do is to reduce phosphorus concentration in the bay because that appears to be an important controlling factor for the growth of algae of all kinds and we want to minimize microcystis abundance. Uh, so I use the model to look at, at uh, several things. What happens if the water gets warmer? There is this thing called global climate change and we're all concerned, well many of us, some of us are concerned <laughs> about uh, uh, the planet getting warmer. So what if Prescott Bay gets warmer? No, don't worry about this. Uh, what, what happens if the, if, if the water in the bay gets warmer each summer? How, what impact will that have on cyanobacterial abundance? Uh, what if we can do something to reduce the phosphorus in the bay? And what, what, can, uh, what will happen if we're able to reduce erosion in the watershed, which would decrease the amount of sediment and detritus that reaches the bay. Those are the things. And then, of course, I, I think a, a desirable goal for us is to have a non-eutrophic bay. So this is, um, uh, this is temperature. So I ran the model several different times, increasing the summer temperature by one degree, then two degrees, then three degrees Celsius each time. And uh, in, in this case, the, this light blue line right here is 2016's behavior. The red line is one degree, and the green line is two degrees, and then the purple line is a three degree increase in temperature. This shows uh, the, that pattern using the peak abundance reached each summer. Uh, you can see quite a remarkable increase. With just one degree of, of warmer 
summer water temperature, the microcystis abundance at the peak would increase by about 160%. Would be 160% of what it was, 60% of an increase. Uh, this, uh, uh, this shows what we could do if we were to uh, decrease the uh, phosphorus going into the bay from the watershed, what would the phosphorus concentration in the bay be? And if we were to reduce the sediment uh, moving into the bay, what impact would that have on phosphorus in the bay? So I don't have enough time to talk in detail about the family of curves here, but uh, it's beneficial to reduce those. But in neither case, and this goes up to a 40% decrease individually of one factor and then individually the other factor, not both together, uh, we don't ever get anywhere close to the eutrophic concentration for phosphorus, which is 24 parts, 25 parts per billion. Uh, we don't get nearly as good a benefit for microcystis, though, by doing either of those things. This is, that, this is the family of curves for reductions of, of phosphorus from the watershed and sediment from the water. Sediment does a better job of decreasing microcystis abundance, surprisingly. So then after doing many runs of this computer model, I found, and I have to jump to the end because I'm... I'm not worried about it. Yes, exactly. Um, I'm doing remarkably well, frankly, uh, in, in sticking to the time uh, because my predecessors were five minutes late, you know. Um, so what if, we, what if we could reduce the stuff coming from the watershed by half? It turns out that's a desirable goal. If we reduce the phosphorus, the nitrate, and the sediment coming out of the watershed into the bay, all of those simultaneously, uh, we could get to our non-eutrophic condition. The, this is a little confusing because in the winter, the, the phosphorus concentration goes back up. Uh, uh, plants are not, suck, are not growing because the water's too cold. So the phosphorus concentration goes up in the winter, it comes down in the summer, and these are the summertime, that's the year one, year two, year three, these are the summertime concentrations, and I averaged from June 1st to the end of September, and this gives us a non-eutrophic phosphorus level after the third year. But if you notice, if you look closely, it starts to go back up again. You see how that's higher than that? starts to go back up again. This is microcystis in response to all of these changes. Microcystis uh, drops down and then gradually seems to get a little bit better. Uh, this is uh, one of my last slides. If it goes back up, where is that coming from? Well, it turns out there's phosphorus in the sediment of the bay. And if you reduce the loadings, the phosphorus in the sediment of the bay becomes, relatively speaking, more important to the organisms. And so a release of phosphorus from the sediments of the bay is of concern and would potentially prevent us from reaching that non-eutrophic status unless we found a way to do something about that. So, warm water is bad. Uh, reducing sediment from the watershed is a more worthwhile management strategy than just going after dissolved phosphorus in the water, uh, focusing on detergents and fertilizers and things like that is good, but it doesn't give us as much bang for the buck as just reducing erosion in the watershed. And we have to do it all in order to hope that we could ever get to a non-eutrophic bay which is an incredible goal. If the community ever launched uh, a, an effort to achieve that, it would be just remarkable. Uh, uh, but we'd also have to do something about the uh, uh, phosphorus that's already in the sediments. So I'm hoping that this computer model will not just die with me, but that uh, I can uh, pass this on to Sean and others who uh, might be able to learn how to use this model and uh, help hopefully make uh, better decisions about management to improve the Bay. Thank you very much.
questions or get your sandwich, and Rick will be glad to sit here and talk to you through the lunch hour about everything. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. The in-bay phosphorus in the sediment that's already there. Well, the sediments of the bay uh, uh, act like a reservoir of everything that's ever been contributed to Prescott Bay over eons. Uh, uh, phosphorus is, um, in combination with some other metals in the water, is fairly insoluble, and so it it tends to accumulate and stay in the sediment. Uh, and then under certain conditions, it's released into the water. So there's no one source for that. It's a ubiquitous chemical that we try to uh, uh, minimize the manufacture of and the use of. For instance, about, was it 10 or 20 years ago that uh, phosphorus-based laundry detergents were outlawed in the Great Lakes uh, region of this? Is that right? Longer than that. 